Well, it's a terrific uh, privilege to be here. Um, it's fun to be introduced by Bob because when I came back from my thesis fieldwork in 1973, uh, I was um, advised by Robert Hind, my advisor, uh, to go and talk to one of the leading experts in primate social ecology. And I got on a train and went down to London, and that was when I first met Bob and spent an hour in his office uh, learning all that he had to know. Well, maybe 1% of it. <laughs> and I'm thrilled that this uh, lecture is um, uh, supported by both the Field Museum and the Leakey Foundation, two of my favorite institutions. We've just been on a brief tour of the evolving planet, and if you haven't been uh, there, it is just a, a terrific display. Um, and there are many others uh, like it here. Uh, I've known the Leakey Foundation for uh, 20, 25 years. They're absolutely uh, incredible for what they've done for the field of biological anthropology, and um, uh, their impact is, is second to none on the field. What I want to do today is sort of talk about paleoanthropology, but not really. Um, I'll introduce my topic by uh, addressing uh, the larger perspective, and we'll come back to that. But as I talk about cooking, what you will find is I will repeatedly say how totally amazing that topic X has not yet been uh, understood very much. And we'll uh, end up looking quite a bit at the nutritional aspects of cooking. But let me explain how I, how I got into this problem. <coughs> Uh, this is, of course, a, a fantasy. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> chimpanzees um, uh, photographed in the act of uh, dipping wands, as they're called, these uh, sticks that they uh, modify, uh, into an ant nest and getting ants out. And David Bygott did this wonderful fantasy uh, that, that chimpanzees cook. But, of course, they don't. And I think this is really important. Now, when we think about the story of human evolution, that so many people have contributed to, uh, then we have a fairly good understanding of the uh, essential anatomy and nature of the relationships of the uh, various hominid species. But it is still a very big puzzle as to what exactly was going on in that critical period between two and a half and one and a half million years ago when we emerge with a species, the full Homo erectus, that some people regard as so similar to ourselves that they call it Homo sapiens. Something big happened to change us from what was essentially a great ape into a human during that period. And one of the ways that we can get at this question is to look at the differences nowadays between the living apes and the living humans. And of course, the person who did more than anything to stimulate that was Lewis Leakey on the left here with Jane Goodall at the time that he was sending her off into the field to do the first field studies in which individual uh, chimpanzees were recognized in their personalities and uh, quality of their social relationships was first uh, vividly described. Well, I was very lucky to join Jane in 1970, 10 years after she started. And uh, as Bob said, I took on the topic of trying to understand the ecological influences on behavior. Because it was a very obvious thing. As you went around with the chimpanzees from month to month, what was available to eat changed, and the chimpanzees responded very obviously. Sometimes there were large food patches and lots of food, and they got into big groups, and they all uh, got very excited and did lots of things like hunting and fighting and having sex. And then at other times, uh, it was a relatively poor food lookout, and they often traveled alone. As we have gone on, uh, for the last 20 years, I've been working in Western Uganda, and we got more detail. And now we can say that we can look at the different females and see that some get more fruit of high quality than others, and those that have slightly better diets than others have infants slightly faster than others, maybe 20% faster, actually, and their infants survive better. And this is something that is discovered by primatologists in general, and indeed by people who study other animals. That little bit of edge in terms of getting some more food has important impacts on reproduction and survival of the young in particular, and this will have very important consequences for evolution, because evolution works on the success of an individual in reproducing. And one can see the same sort of thing at a comparison across species. So here we've got bonobos on the left, chimpanzees on the middle, and gorillas on the right. And these species have wildly different social systems. And we think, OK, there should be some ecological things that underlie this. Well, if we look at their diets, uh, all of them are eating ripe fruit as their preferred object. Uh, and um, 
as their preferred uh, diet. And uh, all of them, when ripe fruit are not uh, easily found, fall back on eating foliage. So they're very similar. What's different is the particular style of the foliage. It, it occurs in a different distribution and the, the foliage are slightly different types. And these, we think, are important influences on the very big differences in their social systems, from stable groups in the gorilla to fission fusion groups in the chimpanzee to uh, much more peaceful uh, semi-stable groups in the bonobo and so on. So then you say, okay, well, does this principle apply to humans, that the social behavior uh, and indeed anatomy of humans is adapted to the diet? Uh, are there differences in the diet that can explain why humans are so different from the other great apes. And we look at the diet and we see that great apes, like this uh, uh, six-year-old here, uh, are chewing for over half the day, six hours a day. They're just chewing. And they're eating wherever they find their food. Whereas every single population of hunters and gatherers that we know of chews very little. The estimate that we can best guess is something around 10% a day. That's, that's uh, a probably a high-end estimate. And uh, what they do, they sometimes eat their food out when they're foraging, but mostly they're bringing it back to the camp and they're cooking it. And that food is both meat and plants. Well, as I'm sure you know, people are focused on the meat-eating aspect of the unique human diet in thinking about an impact on human evolution. So the standard story, the conventional wisdom, is that um, they uh, started either scavenging or hunting at some point uh, in the great ape past, the Australopithecine past, and our ancestors uh, then developed uh, ultimately a whole range of features that are associated with uh, humans. And these happened because meat is different from other foods in various ways. It provides more calories, it provides uh, or it demands a series of social skills, and therefore can lead to things like uh, improved cognitive abilities. It demands technical skills and therefore can uh, lead to uh, all sorts of tool use and the need to have a long childhood where they can learn these things. And the high quality package has been uh, uh, given the role of uh, having a very big influence on our social relationships, such as um, uh, the fact that we have households with males bringing meat back to a female. Now, you'll be sorry to hear that I'm not gonna cover all of these topics today. But I just want to draw attention to this, and I want to uh, come right out and say it's quite clear that meat eating has indeed been very important, and there are lots of reasons for it. Um, you know, there's very clear evidence of meat eating was important in the Lower Paleolithic because we have all sorts of lovely fossil bones with cut marks on them. And, uh, and meat eating is very important in modern hunters and gatherers, consuming about 50% of the calories that they get, and so on. But then let me just skip through that stuff and say that one of the reasons I think that conventional wisdom has been totally dominated by the thought that meat is really the only important thing is that no one considered that there was any other food that could be big enough to explain how humans evolved from what I'm calling a great ape, an australopithecine. Well, the funny thing is that not all of the story about meat eating really works very well, and there are a number of anthropologists now that are starting to say, wait a minute, uh, we have very small blunt teeth, and this happened early on in hominization that our ancestors' teeth became small and blunt and not at all well adapted for eating meat. Exactly the opposite of what you'd expect, and um, it now seems that they're adapted for something soft, according to the, the, the tooth experts. And then there are anthropologists, uh, studying hunters and gatherers, who say meat eating uh, is, is very risky because uh, it's a chancy business. They may, the hunters may go out on day one and not succeed in getting any meat. On day two, on day three, sometimes uh, only once a month do the hunters and gatherers bring food back, bring meat back to the camp. And then there's another problem, which is that if you eat a lot of meat, then uh, you run a risk of protein poisoning unless you have about 50% of your diet coming from fat or carbohydrate. But the big thing is that cooking has never been considered. Now this is very odd. It's really extreme. I mean, here is a book, Food and Evolution Towards a Theory of Human Food Habits, published about 10 years ago. Cooking is not in the index. I had a, a student a survey biological anthropology textbooks. The average biological anthropology textbook uh, has about a paragraph and a half on cooking, 
which is about as much as it gives to the evolution of the chair. <laughs> Even people who specifically are interested in the question of dietary reconstruction, the paleo diet, never mentioned cooking. I, I, I love this example because um, uh, the, uh, the authors of this particular book um, uh, talks about the importance of understanding uh, the past diet and, uh, and the composition and so on, never mentions cooking, but then gives a series of recipes. <laughs> Everyone is cooked, of course. <laughs> and uh, of course, you know, archaeologists are fascinated by the fire question, but uh, when they see fire as coming in, they don't draw attention very often to its significance for cooking. I put up this quote particularly because I, I enormously admire uh, Nama Goran Inbar, um, and uh, she's right on top of things, but she still represents conventional wisdom in saying, what did fire do? Well, uh, protection from predators, warmth and light, and the exploitation of a new range of foods. <laughs> okay, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. And then you've got this uh, remarkable thing that the, the big work on cooking that came into anthropology during the last 40, 50 years was Levi Strauss's book, The Raw and the Cooked. And uh, uh, he, this was a structural anthropology, a symbolic theory of cooking. People cook in order to separate themselves conceptually from nature. Uh, people do not have to cook their food. They do so for symbolic reasons. Well, that's OK. You know, it's, it's a hypothesis. But what is striking about that is that no biological anthropologist ever challenged this. People just said, oh, OK, that's fine. Now, there's no question about what the major reason for the lack of interest in cooking is. Because if you go back more than 50 years, you find that there were anthropologists who said, you know, cooking looks pretty darned important. But as archaeological evidence got better in the last few hundred thousand years, uh, it became problematic. And here is Desmond Clark, a, a very strong member of the Leakey Foundation before he died recently. Uh, saying uh, that fire has not been thought of as very important in human evolution is surely due to the fact that the evidence of fire has generally not survived. And the typical pattern, the cartoon version, is this, that there's lots of evidence of fire use by Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis in the last, uh, uh, say, definitely 200,000 years, and almost everyone is comfortable up to about 400,000 years. Some people say, well, it's a bit dicey past 300,000 years. And then there's occasional other sites like this one here, which is uh, this one where Norma Goran Inbar has excavated a site with uh, evidence that was sufficiently good to convince the reviewers of the journal Science. And most people would say that's pretty good. So the interpretation of this tends to be, well, okay, so fire came in big here, and maybe people used it a little bit earlier, but it can't have been very important because you get lots of sites without it. And uh, then the lower Paleolithic down here at uh, Back to 1.6 million years, you've got a few sites where people say, you know, I think I've got some evidence of fire, but it doesn't look very convincing, so let's forget it. Now, I just want to hover on this point very briefly, uh, because the point about this is that there's very little systematic attempt so far to understand about the evidence of fire in relationship to the opportunities for the evidence for fire. And I, I support that claim by looking here at Victoria Ling's analysis, uh, which I think is the first one uh, from any era, uh, of the evidence for fire in the European Lower Paleolithic. So what I just showed you is that there's a lot of evidence for fire here. Here is uh, the present. And we're going back and we're seeing these uh, interglacials here and the glacials here. And uh, there's lots of fire evidence here, so we will forget that. Uh, but then, when you get past quarter of a million years ago, in Europe, uh, here is a glacial and uh, no evidence of fire, no sites with fire. And then there's an interglacial and there are three sites with fire, and then you see this pattern where um, here is, uh, for those of you who know, marine isotope stage 11, and lots of evidence of fire there, odd, and then none here, none here. Well, the first thing is it looks as though it's just difficult to find evidence of fire in the glacials, and that's because you've got glaciers coming through and wiping the slate clean, and probably weren't many people living there anyway. Uh, so in the, um, uh, the glacials, uh, it's uh, more interesting, in the interglacials, but now let's look at the number of sites, period. Well, this varies a lot as well. So there were lots in marine isotope stage 11, and fewer in these sites. Uh, 
Um, but if we then convert that to percentages, we get a different picture from the original, which is that uh, you get a proportion of sites that uh, have evidence of fire, and uh, they are much more common in the uh, interglacials, the warmer periods, than in the colder periods. And the lesson I draw from this is that we don't have any clear cutoff. All we can say about fire is, well, uh, it's possible that it was being used quite regularly for some time that we don't know. And we can go back into the Lower Paleolithic, and, and here are the African sites. This is a funny mixture of European, because that, that systematic analysis. Here is the present. Now we're going back down this way. And uh, there is spotty evidence for fire claimed by particular people from their particular sites going back to at least 1.6 million years ago. So my reading of the fire evidence is you can't say anything either way. All you can say is it's perfectly possible there was fire in the past. You cannot say there was definitely a time when it, it uh, started or stopped. So that means to me that it's perfectly reasonable to take up a hypothesis that in a sense you can trace to James Boswell who, uh, when uh, challenged to think of what it was that was most characteristic of humans, said it wasn't tool-making and it wasn't the fact that we were naked and bipedal. He said, it's a cooking animal. The beasts can do all sorts of other things, but uh, no beast is a cook. Everybody cooks their food, even if it's just putting salt and pepper on it, after it's been given to you by a real cook. <laughs> and the essential idea that um, I have been uh, besotted by for the last uh, decade is that we need to bring cooking into the picture, uh, where what I've done in, in this slide is to have exactly the same slide as before for meat, except now instead of scavenging and hunting here, we've got fire control and cooking plus meat, all of them important, going to the same sets of things and then through different mechanisms producing all of these very special things about humans. And I'm not gonna talk about many of them, uh, but I'm perfectly prepared to entertain questions about any of them. So that's where I want to go. But the really key question here is, what is the meaning of cooking in terms of our biology? Because that's the essential, amazingly missing ingredient. I mean, here is something that everybody does. I haven't shown you the evidence that everybody does it, but everybody does. And we know extraordinarily little about what it means for us. So I want to go through this, and um, first of all, we'll talk um, about uh, the curious business of the energy paradox involving starchy foods, and then we'll go off and talk about uh, the animal protein foods. And what I'm going to be saying is uh, that uh, there is increasing evidence that what cooking does systematically, most importantly, is to provide energy. So if you go to the nutritional literature, as I have tried to do, uh, or to the anthropological literature, you will find a whole slew of reasons for why we cook, and different people put them uh, in different places. I don't think I've found a single place where someone says, you know, the important thing about cooking is that it provides us with extra energy. There is this thing, uh, it uh, increases the digestibility. And uh, why that should be important, uh, I haven't seen people discussing. It sort of sounds nice. Great, it's more digestible. We're not going to get a tummy ache. Um, I, I, I don't want to be sort of too strong on this. You know, there may be people who, who have sort of said, well, and, that, and this is really important because it's going to provide more calories for us, but it certainly is not at all prominent. And there's a whole bunch of other reasons here which you see um, which uh, are uh, very strong in some people's view, uh, that the really important reason is what uh, the chef Escoffier said. It's to please the palate of the consumer. And therefore, what we're really talking about with cooking is improving the palatability, the texture and flavor, appearance and smell. And, and uh, whether or not it actually is good for us nutritionally is a totally different question. And then on the other hand, there's lots of evidence that cooking is bad for us in various different ways. Now, the ones outlined in yellow here are uh, ways that reduce the amount of energy in the food. And you will find much literature in the nutritional area, where this is discussed more than um, in anthropology, suggesting that the overall effect of cooking various foods is to reduce the digestibility. And therefore, from my perspective, to reduce the amount of energy. 
and we'll go through a little bit about why that should be. But uh, uh, you cook a bit of meat and uh, uh, water uh, carrying fat and maybe some soluble proteins uh, uh, drips out and gets lost. Um, when uh, you cook, uh, what you do is to accelerate a reaction, the Maillard reaction, which uh, leads to an, a, a, a complex formed between amino acids and sugars. And uh, those things reduce the amount of energy available because those things can no longer be digested. And uh, they have problems um, which uh, lead to poor health, uh, such as the inflammatory agents, and some of them are uh, carcinogenic. So you will find uh, people who particularly focusing on animal protein say, uh, we cook because we like it, but we lose as a result. How odd, how odd that every hunter-gatherer, every evening, has a cooked meal, and it takes a lot of work to organize it. It takes a lot of time to do it, particularly if, you have, if you're an Eskimo, but, but um, uh, anywhere, it, it's, a, it's a sweat. And we should do this, and yet it might reduce the amount of energy. We'd be a completely weird primate, different from any other species, because we'd be going against the rule that says natural selection maximizes the available energy in order to maximize reproduction. Well, now, you might be sitting here and saying, this is all very well, but it's a bit exaggerated because surely everybody knows that cooking increases the uh, energy that you get from starchy foods. And you'd sort of be right. But I want to draw attention to something very odd in the way that the conventional nutritional wisdom treats starchy foods. And this question mark is meant to signify the fact that when we cook, there is one body of data that says it increases the digestibility of starch, just focusing on starch now, and another which says there's no effect at all. Here is the critical graph. These data I took from two sources. I mean, literally, this one I took from the US Department of Agriculture who have a website and printed documents which provide nutrient composition data for every food you can think of, several thousand foods. And many of these are presented with the nutritional data raw and the nutritional data cooked. So you can compare how many calories are there in a raw 100 grams of rice compared to a cooked 100 grams of rice. And you have to sort out the amount of water in it and take out the water. But once you get the energy density of calories per 100 grams when raw and plot it against the energy density uh, when it is cooked, then I was expecting to see, well, some percentage, 10%, 20%, 30 40 something more if it's cooked. But in fact, as you see, there is no difference. There is a bit of slop around the line. But uh, this is essentially isometric. What this is saying is that the uh, number of calories per gram in cooked food is exactly the same as the number of calories per gram in raw food. So nutritionists, if you talk to a nutritionist, of course they don't think this is actually right. But these are the data that are presented by the gold standard source that everybody uses for all of their nutritional information. And the equivalent is true in Britain where I dealt with the sixth edition of McCants and Widowson produced by the Institute of Food Safety. And again, uh, uh, thousands of foods, and you compare raw and cooked, exactly the same. What on earth is going on? No wonder the public is confused. This seems to me actually dangerous, because if somebody chose to eat raw food and used the data presented here, they would die. And that would be bad for the USDA, because their relatives could sue them for having produced nonsense information. This all goes back to the source of the uh, convention by which we judge the amount of calories in food. And it was initiated by Wilbur Olin Atwater uh, more than 100 years ago, who developed the first and only system uh, for doing so. And what he did, he uh, was uh, uh, originally agricultural chemist, and he devised an improved form of bomb calorimeter. Now, some of you may know, remember this from high school. A bomb calorimeter is, uh, is this, this machine here. Uh, and uh, what it is, uh, you put a little sample of food into a canister, and then uh, you ignite it, you explode it, and then the, uh, this gives off heat. And the amount of heat 
can be measured by the rise in temperature of the water in which the canister is immersed. So this is wonderful because it's a very good standardized way of finding out how much um, uh, energy there was in food. And he, he took carbohydrates and proteins and fats, and uh, he exploded them. And uh, he found that uh, in uh, carbohydrate, there's uh, something like four calories per gram, and in fat, there's nine calories per gram. And uh, then he, he was able to use this for his system. So this was a, a nice, simple, well-organized system. Uh, and uh, he wasn't stupid. He understood that uh, the gross energy is what he was dealing with there. And uh, then there was going to be some losses, some food that maybe was not digested and would pass out in the feces. So you subtract those. And then that leaves the metabolizable energy. And that's what goes onto the food labels on the side of your breakfast cornflakes. So one, you get by bomb calorimetry. And uh, you subtract those other things, and uh, that's fine. Now, uh, the problem is that uh, how much is lost depends on all sorts of things. This was good. This, it's amazing to, to realize what life was like in those days. At the time that Atwater did his work, people had the fantasy, or within a decade of, of that period, that humans might be such a special species that we would get more food, more energy out of our food than other species. And what Atwater was doing, essentially, was showing that we obey the laws of thermodynamics. And that we're not so wonderful. We're just like any other animal. We digest our food, and, we, and it's related to these number of calories. So, so that was great. But it's been taken too far. The problem is humans are actually not bomb calorimeters. We do not explode our food. We digest it in rather complicated ways. And so problems emerge. This uh, is the heat energy, the delta heat energy. It's sometimes called the specific dynamic action, uh, the uh, postprandial thermogenesis, the thermic effect. And you may know it that when you eat, you can get hot. And this happens to all animals. And this is a cost of digestion that turns out to be quite high. It varies between sometimes less than 5%, but up to 40% of the food you're paying for. You're not just exploding all of it, and then uh, anything that doesn't emerge in the feces, you're using the rest of it. Not at all. You are paying to get it. And the costs you pay vary on how well it is processed, as well as the composition of the food in various different ways. Secondly, the digestibility of the food varies. Atwater just made an assumption that with protein, it's this percentage that is digested. And with carbohydrate, it's that percentage. He did some experiments. He found that that was uh, the case. And he said, well, that's just going to be generally applicable. But actually, it varies a lot. Uh, starches can vary from being 100% digestible to 0% digestible. And he forgot another big thing, too, which is that uh, people like you and me, uh, we are, so in a sense, two organisms. One organism is the thing we can see, and the other organism that is eating a lot of food is all those bacteria in our hind guts. And if any proteins get through into our hind guts, those bacteria use them, and we don't at all. If any carbohydrates get into our hind guts, then those bacteria use about 50%, and we get about 50%. And that, those figures uh, vary. So uh, it's no good just looking at the feces and saying, well, anything that did not appear in the feces is being used by the body. It's not true at all. You could have a lot of protein that uh, passes through most of our guts undigested and then gets into the large bowel and is all eaten by these bacteria, and then nothing appears uh, in the feces. And you'd say, hey, we use all that protein. But we didn't. It was the bacteria. What this all means is that the Atwater system, which is the system that underlies the food labeling system in the United States, the United Kingdom, and everywhere else, is wrong. It doesn't work. It systematically overestimates the food energy value because it treats our foods as if they're being exploded in a bomb calorimeter. It, there's a problem. The physical effects of cooking are very complex, and so you can't easily solve the problem. And that's why it hasn't been solved. It's not because people are stupid. It's because they don't want to grapple with the difficulty of trying to solve it. But the result is there is no current system that can assess the food value of cooked foods compared to raw foods. This is the amazing position that we are in. And I'm a primatologist, so 
uh, it's a bit cheeky of me to come in and sort of burrow into these fields that I basically know nothing about, but um, uh, and, and make these points. I'm, I'm now uh, confident because I've talked to some of the top nutritionists in the field about this, but I just want to point out that there are lots of studies of primate foods which suffer from the same kinds of problems. So, for instance, primates like soft leaves rather than uh, uh, tough leaves, and probably the uh, soft leaves give them more energy just because they're soft, because being soft they have a lower cost of digestion. So the whole principle of using metabolizable energy, in the words of Jeffrey Livesey, uh, one of actually dozens of nutritionists who object to it, is totally flawed. But the one thing we can say is that cooked starch undoubtedly provides more energy than raw food, so it's a lie what we see in the USDA or the Institute of Food Safety um, accounts. Now let's try and see if we can do this thing properly. We can't get through to a quantitative measure exactly, but let's look at, at the way we should look at it. Uh, I don't know if any of you know someone who has had uh, an ileostomy. Uh, an ileostomy is um, uh, uh, leaves a patient uh, with no large bowel. They've lost their hind gut, this part. And so as a result, what the doctor does is to give, at the end of the small intestine, which here is the end of the ileum, uh, a little exit onto a bag, which you have on your stomach here. And uh, that bag is very useful for people who are interested in nutrition because it means that you can recover the products of what is eaten before it gets into the large bowel. This is, uh, uh, enables people to look at digestibility uh, at the end of the ileum, the ileal digestibility. And since the 1940s, people have known this is the way to do it, but still the nutritional uh, literature is full of people who ignore this, particularly actually in primatology. Uh, so uh, here is Atwater getting digestibility from uh, the feces, and what you should do is get it from the uh, end of the ileum because after this you've got the bacteria who are eating all that stuff. Uh, so you, you can sample the ileal effluence and, uh, and you can show that this, this works. It doesn't affect the uh, rate at which the food moves through the gut uh, and uh, you get very satisfying correlations with uh, laboratory experiments. So this is the gold standard method for assessing digestibility. So now let's look what happens with various starch sources. Here is a green banana and um, using ileal digestibility in vivo, in, in real life experiments with ileostomy patients where you sample every 15 minutes or whatever it is from the end of the ileum. The digestibility of the starch, 47% when it's raw and 98% when it's cooked. And in vitro experiments, in this particular one, you've got a comparison for the raw, 45.8. Green banana, again, very similar results. Wheat, 71, 96. Potato, 96, if this is right, if this in vitro matches the in vivo, uh, again, a, a huge rise. Everyone understands why it is that starch digestibility increases enormously when uh, it is cooked, but I think that we haven't absorbed the fact that uh, these figures are very large. Now, uh, they're going to vary with the size of the starch granules um, and... Uh, uh, the particular chemical characteristics, the proportion of, of the two major components, uh, amylopectin and amylose, that all sorts of things will, will vary, so it makes it complicated, but we just know it's a lot. Uh, you can look at the same thing by looking at how rapidly glucose gets into the blood. Here is an old experiment showing that uh, if someone uh, is given a meal of uh, cooked cornstarch compared to raw cornstarch, and you sample the blood subsequently, then uh, when they eat cooked, you get a rapid rise in glucose in the blood, in, in uh, glucose in the blood, which is equivalent to uh, eating glucose straight. It's not very different from that. Whereas raw cornstarch, you get much less. And the important point about this is that the area under the curve remains much higher for the cooked. It's not that uh, it's simply slower eating the raw cornstarch. You see a lot of stuff nowadays saying that um, these uh, low uh, GI foods, glycemic index foods, are good because they cause you to um, have a low rate of glucose coming into the blood. But the implication people don't often address is that actually in the end you get the same amount of food. But uh, my reading of the literature is that mostly you get this kind of pattern where uh, it, the actual total amount digested is reduced. <laughs> 
So we know what's going on here because starch granules, uh, when they are cooked, they uh, uh, change their permeability to enzymes. There is a physical change uh, in these things. Uh, so it's not surprising any of this. It's just that we need to bring it out and, and understand more about it. And it's not surprising when you look at what empirical data there are on the effects of cooking on animals that eat them. So here is one of, of many uh, such results uh, where pigs in this case have a higher weight gain if they're given uh, cooked as opposed to raw food. People haven't done many deliberate experiments comparing cooked and raw, but there are enough to see this pattern uh, uh, being repeated. So with the Outwater Convention, it's as if um, there isn't any effect of cooking starch, but the data constantly show that cooked food uh, leads to more energy as judged by daily weight gain or milk output in cows or um, the weight of your pet dog. Um, fish farms, salmon, the, the productivity of fish farms enormously increase when they cook the fish meal compared to giving it raw. Um, uh, even insect pests are fed on uh, cooked food when you want to uh, rear them in the lab. And the same is true with humans. Here is one of dozens of pictures on the web <laughs> of people who tout the benefits of raw food. And it's true. It's a, it's a great way to lose weight. Uh, so, you know, Angela achieved this uh, on her raw food, even though uh, she was eating domesticated foods, which have been selected to be very high quality compared to anything you eat in the wild, uh, coming from uh, places all the way around the world. So there's no seasonal loss at any place, because if America isn't producing them, South Africa is, and not doing very much compared to hunters and gatherers. And yet, on raw diets, you know, she's ending up uh, looking pretty, pretty slender. And um, this is, is systematically true. Here are data showing uh, the effect of raw versus cooked food. And uh, here we have um, a series of people who eat cooked food. And actually, four here are people who eat cooked food, uh, both meat and um, vegetable. And here are their body mass indexes. Uh, so they are uh, sort of healthy. Uh, and the, the raw people may well be healthy, but every sample you find of the body mass index of people on raw diets is uh, substantially below those uh, who are eating uh, the cooked diet. And uh, in the best, uh, most closely monitored study by Corinna Kobnik of uh, 570 German raw foodists, she found that as the proportion of food eaten raw increased, uh, you know, they call themselves raw foodists, even if they're only eating 75% raw. It's incredibly difficult to do. You've got to have an eye on will. It's, it's very difficult to resist the smell of a pizza. Um, <laughs> but, but as they get up to 100%, look at this, 50% of the women completely amenorrheic. This doesn't seem too good if you're a hunter-gatherer, trying to reproduce as much as possible. And if 50% were not menstruating at all, that means that a whole extra proportion were, would have very uh, poor reproductive performance. And this is unlike uh, vegetarians, uh, who um, have uh, actually even better um, ovulatory cycles than uh, meat eaters, uh, on average. So all of this suggests to me that humans are just not well adapted at all to eat to raw plant diets, which is completely different from chimpanzees. So I mean, I think we can, we can nail that one. All right, so that's starch. Uh, we need to recognize that cooking starch uh, we know the mechanism. Uh, we, uh, we see endlessly evidence that cooked starch is a better diet. Uh, we, we need to recognize that uh, it provides more energy. But it's much more puzzling when we turn to animal uh, proteins because here is where the nutritionists are much more assertive that cooking is actually problematic in reducing the amount of energy. And I'm going to challenge that view. I think this is one of the most amazing things. Um, meat science, you, you may not have come across meat science, but if you get into this area, it's a big deal. Um, it's got a, many textbooks called meat science. There's a journal of meat science which has been going for 70, 80 years. Um, there are a lot of meat scientists, and they are dedicated to uh, understanding and researching what happens in all the way from producing meat to getting it to the consumer's mouth. But here is Paul Warris, author of one of the textbooks, telling me by email, uh, with permission, uh, the effects of cooking on the energy value of meat do not seem to have been a topic of interest to meat scientists. So what they're saying is, as long as the consumer likes it, we're happy. 
But if you look at the reviews, most of them conclude that the energy in meat is reduced by being cooked. So this is odd because you certainly get some contrary evidence. And uh, here is, is an example that goes back uh, quite a long time. Um, uh, Wilma Clifford, 1930, uh, she took bits of meat and did some in vitro experiments, some laboratory experiments. So what she did, for instance, with the roast top side here, uh, was uh, either to have it uh, raw or to have it cooked. And then she exposed it to, uh, here, trypsin only, one of the proteolytic enzymes in our guts, and then a combination of pepsin and trypsin, which is a better mimic of what happens in our guts. And consistently, she found that uh, the cooked was much more digestible than the raw. And these are not trivial differences. This was a well, what, 100% difference or something. And it didn't matter about the different kinds of meat. And then uh, just last year, a student of mine, Rachel Carmody, did a wonderful experiment. And the amazing thing about this experiment is that we can't find anybody who has published an experiment like this. There's an extraordinary lack of interest. Actually, that Wilma Clifford uh, paper here, published in 1930, that was commented on in The Lancet, the big British journal, and it said, well, of course, this makes sense because we know rats and mice have often been fed and shown that they do better on cooked diets. We can't, it, they didn't cite any cases, and we can't find any of the cases they refer to. So Rachel did this herself, and she fed mice on uh, raw diets here. Um, this was the standard chow plus a big chunk of it being raw or cooked beef. And uh, the yellow is the standard chow without additional meat. And those eating uh, the cooked meat did just as well in terms of their growth performance as those on the control diet. And those eating raw uh, did worse. They end up uh, with uh, less energy in their bodies, their smaller bodies. And this is interesting because uh, she was able to measure the amount eaten, and they actually ate more of the raw, indicating that they're not digesting it as well. Now, <laughs> there's very little direct data on this. And, and raw eggs is just one of the most fascinating areas because this is a place where you would expect that there should be very little impact, if any, of cooking. Because for... 80 years, I think it is, uh, bodybuilders have declared that raw eggs are just the thing to pack on the protein. And, and uh, Vince Gironda, one of the, uh, uh, the big influences, said up to 36 a day is not a bad idea. <laughs> well, it makes sense in a way because egg protein is very high quality. The amino acid distribution uh, just about matches what we want. Um, the recorded digestibilities were very high but these were cooked. And it's got very high biological value as measured by experiments in which you give this to rodents. And um, in fact, it's the highest known biological value. If you feed them on egg protein compared to milk and fish and beef and so on, uh, it's just absolutely spiffy. And it's, it's a sort of diverse collection of things that are, are meant to be easy to use, right? Because that's what they're doing in the egg. They're meant to be able to, to help the growing embryo do really well, and nobody else is competing for it. They don't have to defend themselves or anything. So uh, this should work fantastically well. Well, just uh, less than 10 years ago, some Belgian gastrointestinal physiologists looked at this for the first time with ileostomy patients. And they were able to use it with a very cunning system in which they labeled the eggs and then saw the rate at which the labeled chemicals emerged in the breath and the urine and the skin, uh, not the skin, the breath and the urine, uh, and um, were able to then uh, calibrate against healthy volunteers. And you see the result. Uh, when uh, it was eaten raw, 51% of the uh, protein was digested. The 49% would have gone into the large bowel where it would have been digested by the bacteria, and then it would have not appeared in the feces, and then the Atwater and his colleagues would have said, hey, it's 100% digestible, but it's not, because the stuff that gets into the large bowel cannot be used. So again, a big increase in the digestibility as a consequence of cooking. So it's the, the magnitude of these numbers that seems to me quite impressive. 
The Belgian team evaluated various hypotheses for why the raw egg protein had reduced digestibility. They were careful to examine them, but they concluded that the answer was denaturation. Now, this is absolutely fascinating because what denaturation is, is the opening up of a normally tightly packed protein to expose it to external influences. In this particular case, proteolytic enzymes, digestive enzymes. And the point about denaturation is it's a totally predictable consequence of heating. Every time you heat a protein, you absolutely denature it. You absolutely open it up. So it's hard for me to imagine that a heated protein is not going to be more accessible to digestion by proteolytic enzymes. So these, these results make sense. Now, there are other things that denature. One of the things that denature, for instance, is acid. So why do we have acid in our stomachs? Why do we have a billion acid-producing cells that are trying to maintain a pH of below 2? Well, it's denaturing what, what goes in there. So in addition to the standard stories of... Um, uh, activating the uh, pepsin and, uh, and killing the bacteria, probably the acid in our stomach is very important in contributing to denaturing and therefore to digestion. And, and many other things, uh, smoking, drying, um, uh, they do this equivalent things. Well, uh, let me pass on um, to the cost of digestion because here is another whole realm that very little has been known about. Um, I said that meat scientists stop at the mouth. They say, what we want to know is, what are consumers like in their meat? And the answer is tenderness. They like flavor a lot as well, but tenderness tends to trump. What they really want is softness, wagyu beef that has been massaged and fed on, I can't remember what it is that they feed it on to make it particularly tender. But anyway, the most tender meat you can imagine. Well, the problem about meat is that it is not just a solution of proteins. This is a typical chunk of meat here, and um, what you're seeing is that the meat protein here in the muscle fiber uh, is wrapped in uh, a difficult protein, namely collagen. And uh, there are three different layers of it before you finally get to the tendon. Gastrointestinal physiologists, if you want to go and find out about meat digestion, you might think that uh, books entitled things like um, the, uh, the gastrointestinal physiology of digestion uh, would be helpful. And they're terrific if you can completely ignore physical structure. They assume that what goes into the stomach is a nice solution of proteins. They do not treat meat as a thing that goes into the stomach. I challenge you to find a textbook that does. And that means that we don't know anything about the effects of cooking on meat because people haven't studied it. But there's an obvious hypothesis because what cooking does is to dissolve this extracellular matrix of collagen, because collagen is a protein, and we know perfectly well, there's all sorts of data showing that, that uh, collagen is, is uh, softened and uh, gelled uh, by uh, heating. It's denatured in a typical way. And we also know from all sorts of animal experiments that less energy is used to digest food when it's less structurally complex. So it's an obvious possibility that what cooking is doing is reducing the cost of digestion no, this is kind of gross, but I, uh, when I figured this out, I, I, I looked at the literature on the cost of digestion, and I found that they, the perfect model system involves the Burmese python. <laughs> because uh, this guy, Stephen Secor in Alabama, has developed a wonderful system with these where he can measure the cost of digestion. So if you look up here at this graph, he feeds an intact rat to a Burmese python. And uh, uh, on day one, uh, there is no response. But then you have an increase in its uh, use of oxygen. That's what these uh, curves are telling you. And each of these things is a day, and he monitors them for a month. So it's using oxygen at a certain rate, quietly in its cage, looking after itself, minding its own business. And then somebody gives it a rat, it eats it, and boom, it increases its... Uh, thermogenesis, it's a rate of oxygen, and then it takes a couple of weeks before it goes back to normal. Now, if you, instead of feeding it an intact rat, feed it a rat that has been ground and put it directly into its intestine, then its thermogenic response is much less. And there are all sorts of experiments with these and toads and other species that show that the structural integrity of the uh, stuff that they are given affects the magnitude of this peak and the overall amount of heat used and therefore the cost of digestion. 
So uh, I uh, asked uh, Stephen if he would be prepared to repeat these experiments with cooked uh, meat and, uh, against raw meat. And so here is our model rat, uh, a bit of uh, steak that has been rolled up into a rat shape. And then this is uh, fed into the python. And uh, then we, we see uh, how much its metabolic rate is changed. And here are the data which um, he produced uh, uh, this year. Uh, a whole rat here, and then we've got our raw intact meat, which uh, was satisfyingly similar to the whole rat. And then when you uh, cook it, you find a reduction in the cost of digestion. This is by being microwaved uh, in a very simple manner. We also looked at the effect of grinding, and here is raw meat that has been ground in an old-fashioned meat grinder, um, and uh, uh, that ground meat has a reduced cost of digestion compared to the raw intact. And then here is the cooked and the ground meat. So basically what you get is two independent effects where if you grind, you reduce the cost of digestion, the SDA, by over 12%. If you cook, it's 12%. And if you grind and cook, it's 23%. So when you process in these ways, you're getting more energy net because you're spending less energy to eat it, which means that you shouldn't have to have such a big sleep after eating cooked meal as opposed to a raw meal. And that is probably why repeatedly in hunters and gatherers you find that animal flesh is both pounded and cooked. When meat is so tender that sinews will fall apart, it's crushed in a mortar. So what we know is that where we've got the really high quality studies, there is a very big effect of cooking on energy, contrary to what we are, as it were, told. And I, if you are a primatologist, thinking about animals desperate for a little bit of extra energy and thinking about its big impact on reproductive fitness in an evolutionary context, and if you're thinking about the fact that humans fare so poorly on raw food, then it seems very likely that humans are adapted to cooking. And that probably explains uh, better than uh, the meat uh, hypotheses various peculiarities of the human gut system, such as the fact that uh, compared to a whole bunch of other primates, humans have a particularly low total gut size. So I'm going on a bit, I'm sorry, but uh, if I, another five minutes or something, well, okay. So um, I said I would try and bring this back to paleoanthropology. And uh, I want to do so by playing the game of pinning the tail on the donkey, <laughs> uh, which is to say, we know that we started cooking sometime. And the question is, when? And uh, we don't know the answer to this, but I'm just going to give you what seems to me the most reasonable evidence. Um, whenever cooking happened, I, it seems to me that what we're talking about is a, is a massive increase in energy. I haven't talked about the impact on softness. I haven't talked about the impact on social behavior. I mean, there's all sorts of big impacts. And it should have done something to human evolution. And at least it should have produced a new species. And producing a new sapiens uh, well, that just doesn't seem reasonable because the Neanderthals were already cooking. There's lots of evidence of fire in this sort of time. So we've really only got a couple of options if we uh, uh, go uh, with the assumption that once they were controlling fire, they would have cooked, which I will defend if anybody wants to ask about that idea. And uh, there's no question when uh, a series of very compatible changes with uh, the potential adoption of cooking happened. So just a couple of points. Uh, here is uh, something I referred to earlier, the drop in tooth size with Homo erectus, the biggest drop in tooth size in uh, human evolution, uh, explaining that by eating more raw meat seems quite tricky. You've obviously got to invoke some kind of processing to do it, and uh, I think the best processing would be uh, cooking. And then here's a, just a fun point that, that I, I'm surprised that people haven't talked about more, but, but people have been sort of closed off in thinking about early fire. Um, around the uh, two million year period when uh, humans were evolving, you had a lot of big dangerous animals in Africa, uh, such as this Dinophilus and Homotherium, large saber-tooths, and an early uh, lion and leopard and hyenas and so on. 
And the, this was a time, if you've been around the uh, evolving planet and seen the Turkana boy, that we got this full commitment to terrestrial locomotion with relatively poor climbing ability as a consequence. And having seen chimpanzees make nests every night to get up away from the things on the ground, it is hard for me to imagine that the Turkana boy was able to make nests in trees because it's just difficult making a nest. You've got to have basically uh, hands on your feet. Uh, and uh, so it seems to me that the, the evidence of a terrestrially committed locomotion in the Turkana boy uh, means that they were almost certainly sleeping on the ground. And I don't see how they could possibly sleep on the ground unless they had a really good defense system. And that obvious defense system would be fire. So there are all sorts of ways in which one can play with this stuff. Another one that's obviously very intriguing to lots of people is uh, the game of uh, looking at the data on uh, increases in brain size and seeing if you can detect times when there were particularly rapid increases that reflect an adaptation to uh, increased dietary quality and more energy. And um, I'm a little bit um, uh, uh, more uh, agnostic about this than sometimes the press picks up because everybody wants to know about brains. But uh, at any rate, it is perfectly possible to invent all sorts of stories about uh, cooking being very important at uh, the uh, emergence of Homo erectus. I won't go into detail because we're a little bit late. Um, the overall scenario, which I haven't tried to justify, but just for your interest, that I would have for uh, hominization is this, that the Australopithecines were kind of basically chimpanzee-like, that instead of eating foliage as a fallback food, they ate roots, they probably had a little bit of meat, but they were still basically great apes, that as we get into the next phase of human evolution, uh, Homo habilis or Australopithecus habilis, then uh, they were undoubtedly eating some meat, and uh, there seems to be no signals of cooking, uh, but in order to eat meat, I think 